Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Alberta Transplant Institute seminar series. Um, our speaker today, the title of our presentation today is Why Do We Hope? A Day in the Life of a Hope Coordinator. Hope being the Human Organ Procurement and Exchange Program, uh, which is Northern Alberta's uh, deceased organ donation process. Um, Maxine Chartrand is our speaker today, and uh, it's wonderful to have her. Received her nursing education at the University of Alberta and subsequently um, attended Northeastern University in Boston, where she received a master's uh, in nursing in 1992. She's been working in critical care since 1985 um, and has mostly been in an academic environment where she's done both bedside nursing as well as teaching at Roxbury Community College, Northeastern University, as well as Grant McEwen University here in Edmonton. She tells us that her passion resides with working with donor families for the past 17 years as a donor coordinator with the HOPE program. And we've certainly, uh, anyone on the front lines um, um, who's had the opportunity to work with her can certainly attest that. So please uh, welcome uh, to you, Maxine, and we're ready for you to take it away. So thank you for inviting the HOPE program to speak. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. So why do we hope? Hope is the belief in a positive outcome related to events and circumstances in one's life. And we got that from Wikipedia. In Canada, organ and tissue donation is an altruistic gift. We hope that providing an opportunity for donation at the end of life, families may find a positive outcome related to tragic events and circumstances that they are experiencing. So my objectives today are just to talk a little bit about the HOPE program, the role of the coordinator, the donation process, a few statistics, and then talking about the critical shortage. So what makes HOPE coordinators so darn cool? Um, this was a, a article in People Magazine in 1983, and they talked about the highly esteemed new nursing role, the organ donor coordinator. I can't say I've ever stood with my foot on a cooler in front of an airplane, but uh, so be it. The Human Organ Procurement and Exchange Program, or HOPE program, is uh, the organ donation program here in Edmonton. Where there are nine HOPE coordinators. All of us have a critical care background, and we cover call 24-7-365. Needless to say, we don't work full-time. All of us work part-time. We're one of 12 different organ donation agencies in Canada. We're responsible for organ donation in Northern Alberta. And we work with our sister programs with the procurement efforts in Southern Alberta, Calgary, Saskatchewan, Mani uh, and Manitoba. Hope coordinators support donor families. We facilitate the donation process and we help raise awareness. We provide information and assistance regarding organ do donation. And we work very closely with our partners in the Comprehensive Tissue Center with tissue donation. So if you ask me what is my primary role, I'm not going to say donation. My primary role as a HOPE coordinator is to assist the donor and or their family in carrying out that donor's end of life wishes. As a consequence of doing that well, donation occurs. So here are pictures of some of our donors that we've had in the past. They come from all walks of life, all ages, and they graciously give a gift to others. So transplantation, is it science fiction? Well, if you read um, tabloids or books in the past, such as Frankenstein, um, you will get the idea that transplant is science fiction but in actual, it is reality. So in re Dr. Christian Bernard in 1967 became a household name. And here's the picture in Life Magazine. He performed the first, the world's first successful heart transplant in South Africa. This gentleman only lived for 18 days and he succumbed from a pneumonia afterwards. In 1967, um, that's when cyclosporin came on the market as well. So then successful transplants started to occur. 
more locally here. This is Dwight Kronick. He lives in Sherwood Park and he received a heart transplant. Dwight did an amazing thing in August of 2008. He competed in an Ironman competition, 22 years post heart transplant. He still is a very active gentleman and um, he is caring for the gift, the heart that he received. This is Frida. Next year, Frida will achieve her 50th year post anniversary for kidney transplant. What an amazing thing that Frida has achieved. In Edmonton, Dr. Lakey, who's a picture of Dr. Lakey here, performed the first kidney transplant in Edmonton in 1967. It was the third kidney transplant completed in Canada. The HOPE program was established a little while after in 1979. It looked very different back then compared to what it is now. So did you know that one organ and tissue donor could potentially benefit up to 80 people? The majority of that 80 come from tissue, do tissue donation. The transplantable organs that we look at are the heart, the lungs. The lungs can be transplanted either as a single lung or a double lung. Usually the double lung works better. The liver can be transplanted as a whole cut down or split liver. One donor usually will have two kidneys up for transplant. The pancreas can be transplanted whole or it can be sent to the clinical islet lab where they do their magic and they isolate the insulin producing cells and then the islet cells are transplanted. The small bowel can be transplanted or any combination of these organs together can be transplanted depending upon the needs of the recipient. The tissues that our comprehensive tissue center looks at are heart valves. They only look at two, the pulmonic and the aortic. The reason for this is those are the most commonly asked for valves by the, uh, trans, uh, the transplant community here in Edmonton. Ocular donation. They look at the cornea as well as the sclera, the skin. The skin can be transplanted either fresh or it can be frozen and used later. The bones, they don't recover all bones in the body. They look at only the bones in the lower leg, but they can make 40 different pieces of bone for transplant and then tendons up to 14. So as you see, the majority of transplant recipients come from tissues. So in Edmonton, we look at where our organs come from locally. We can have donors at the University Hospital, the Royal Alec, the Grey Nuns, and the Misericordia Hospital. If there are donors identified at the Sturgeon, um, we ask that they be referred into uh, one of the central hospitals. We also get organs from all across Canada and into the United States the United States as well. The majority of the organs we transplant in Edmonton come from our distant centers. So in the following slides, I'll just review the donation process in more detail. So donors are usually identified in the emergency or ICU room settings. They, these individuals have suffered a catastrophic neurological injury. Some of the causes of this are from stroke, head trauma, motor vehicle collision, cardiac arrest, and unfortunately, more and more of our donors are dying from drug overdoses. We have a dedicated donor bed in the neuro ICU at the, at the U of A, it's on 4A4. If a donor is identified or a potential donor is identified outside of our region, such as in Grand Prairie, uh, Yellowknife or Fort McMurray, they can, the uh, MRPs can utilize Rapid North to transfer the individual into Edmonton. All resuscitative and treatment options are explored for these individuals. The neurological injury is not compatible with meaningful recovery. So either brain death is determined or there's a recommendation to withdraw medical support and allow these individuals to pass away with dignity. So neurological determination of death, that's the usual case. It's an irreversible loss of consciousness and cessation of brainstem function. It's equivalent to death. Even though the individual's heart continues to beat, the patient is supported on a ventilator and they're supported pharmacologically with medications to support their blood pressure, their heart rate. 
Very few people pass away in this manner, less than 3% of all deaths. Families have a very difficult time with this. And the reason being is that their loved one is warm and they still can see that their chest rise and fall. They appear just to be in a deep sleep. Brain death is done in accordance with the Alberta Human Tissue and Organ Donation Act. Two separate clinical tests must be done or a cerebral blood flow scan or another ancillary test proving that there's no blood flow to the brain. And the licensed physicians who perform this cannot be involved with transplantation or selecting of the transplant recipients. So donation after cardiac death occurs in the hopeless cases where the individual is not brain dead yet, but they are so close to being brain dead and a decision to withdraw life support is made. This decision is made independent of the donation decision and prior to the donation decision. Organ donation will occur immediately after this individual's heart has stopped beating and the patient has been declared deceased. We started this process in Edmonton in 2009, and we currently now are uh, assessing MAID patients who want donation, and they then are considered for DCD donation. So either the individual is brain dead or they're considered for DCD. The family express interest in donation and the MRP discusses the potential or the MRP discusses the potential for donation with the family. The HOPE program is consulted. Studies show that the earlier an organ donation organization such as HOPE is involved in talking with the family, this increases consent rates from the family. So age limits um, have to be taken into account. So for our neurologically deceased donors, uh, age does not matter. The health of our in, the individual organ at the time of death is more important than the age of the individual. Organ assessments are completed to determine the suitability of each organ for transplant and ensure that it's a healthy organ. Our average age of our donors is 40 years old. That's not that old. Our youngest donor was four days old and we successfully transplanted that baby's heart. Our oldest donor has been 89 years old and we successfully transplanted their liver. Age limits on the other hand do apply for donation after cardiac death donors. It is 70 years old. And age limits apply for each individual tissue being considered for donation. There are only two absolute deferrals for organ donation, current metastatic cancer and HIV infection. We will not accept and move forward if we know that the donor has these because we will give our recipients that metastatic cancer and the HIV infection. Organ transplants are life-saving and risks, many risks are taken for the benefit of the transplant recipient. We do serological testing on our donors. We do hepatitis testing for hepatitis C as well as hepatitis B. And even if these results come back positive, it doesn't stop donation. The transplant physicians will choose an appropriate recipient and the disease process will be managed in the recipient. Tissue donation on the other hand has many deferral reasons. No risk is taken, and that is because tissue transplants are considered life enhancing. So there are many ways that we can indicate our wishes for donation. The one that works the best is registering online or at the motor vehicles um, when you go to renew your uh, license the, uh, for, on the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Registry. You can register your intent and consent. Then you can get on your license, a nice little heart that says donor. Or if you don't want to do that, you can just sign the back of your Alberta personal health care card. People can also indicate it in their living wills or personal directives. Unfortunately, these don't come out until well past the passing of uh, the individual. And so if the family is not aware of the wishes of their loved one, um, they 
are unable to carry out their loved one's wishes. The most important thing is, is whatever your decision is, is make sure your family and friends are aware of what your decision is. So once an individual is referred, um, then we go on uh, and we've talked to the donor family uh, discussing organ and tissue donation with them. It is time for us to get the consent. The legal next of kin is approached for consent. The legal next of kin is very different or can be different than the family spokesperson. And at times it can be very complicated for us to sort out. The legal next of kin gets to consent for what organs will be donated. The purpose of the donation, is it for transplant research and or teaching? And a HOPE coordinator has to complete this. I remember one of the families that I consented, um, the husband consented for his wife, she was the donor. And he chose not to consent her eyes or her heart, but he consented everything else and for research and teaching. And I, in my conversation with him, I asked him why. And he said, her heart, he, she was the love of his life. So no one else could have her heart and her beautiful blue eyes. She, he was the only one who could look into them. There's an absolutely amazing emotional reason for that. Then we move on to assessing our donor. It is extensive and it can take a long time. We have a medical social history questionnaire where we ask general medical and surgical history questions just to get a general idea of the individual's health. We also ask a lot more invasive questions, their social history. We ask about sex, drugs, alcohol, and smoking. We ask that to determine risk of increased risk behaviors. We do a physical exam on our donors. And once again, that is to identify increased, potential increased risk behaviors or disease processes. Lab and diagnostic testing is ordered, including the serology I mentioned earlier. And then each individual organ that has been consented, we do extra testing as well. So for instance, if the heart has been consented, we do 12 lead ECGs, echoes and angiograms. And for lungs, we'll do chest x-rays, bronchoscopies, and CTs, uh, CT of the chest. With donor management, we look at hemodynamic support for our donor. So they uh, can either be hypertensive or hypotensive. Usually, they're hypotensive. But we can give them medications to either control their blood pressure, bring it down, or we can give them inotropes to bring up their blood pressure, or maybe they just need some fluid we optimize their fluid balance. Many of our donors go into diabetes insipidus, and it's not unusual for a donor to pee a liter an hour. And if that's not controlled, then they definitely become hypotensive. They definitely become dehydrated and their electrolytes go out of balance. If uh, you've ever taken care of a donor, the, blood, the frequency of the blood work is uh, it's quite astounding and it can be done up to every four hours. We manage their uh, pulmonary care. Um, we make sure that their oxygenation is good because the oxygen is be being delivered to the organs and we want healthy organs. Our donors do not have temperature regulation. So we either have them on a heating blanket or a cooling blanket. Might look like they have a fever but it's because they no longer have temperature regulation. We monitor and treat any coagulopathy and infection control. If they have positive cultures, uh, we put them on antibiotics. But if they do not have any positive cultures, we tend not to have our donors on antibiotics. Donor management is a team approach. Many times we're talking to transplant ID as well as our HOPE medical director asking, is there anything else we have to do? And are these organs safe for transplant? Once we've gathered all our information, it's time to allocate the organs. So you think that the sickest person would get the organ. That's not necessarily true. They are considered first, but if they don't match appropriately, they aren't selected for that organ. The transplant surgeons and physicians are the individuals who decide who gets the organ. 
they look at blood group, they look at height, weight, and in our heart group, they're now looking at gender as well. And they, sometimes they decline the organ for a gender mismatch. We have organ sharing agreements across Canada for the heart, the liver, as well as kidneys. So the sickest person in Canada on the heart list will be looked at first for our donor heart. We look at our donors HLA and the antibodies that our recipients have, do they match? And we look at the serology of our donors and what the serology is in the recipient. Here where I have numerous phone calls where it can be 200 plus, that is not an exaggeration. Once recipients are selected, the HOPE program will talk to re the recipient coordinators to ensure that we're sharing the appropriate information with the recipient coordinator so that they can bring the recipient into hospital and prepare them for transplant. Depending upon the organ group, Edmonton's recipient waste lists can encompass recipients in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Northwest Territories and BC. Sometimes it's quite a juggling act for the recipient coordinators to get the recipients here in time. So the time from consent to going to organ recovery can be 36 to 48 hours or even longer. We've come to the realization that there is no need for speed. We have to set realistic expectations with the donor family, the ICU, the OR, as well as the transplant surgeons. There many times are competing cases locally and distant um, that organs are coming in. I remember one weekend when we had two local donors, thank heavens they both were on 4A4. We had two donors in Calgary and we had accepted a liver from a different program. Many organs were transplanted that weekend. It even made the papers. The more important thing was is all of these cases had to be lined up and realistic expectations had to be discussed with all involved. The other thing is, is donors are becoming more and more complex. And the more complex is the donor, the longer it takes us to assess them. We take into consideration the family needs and requests. Many time, times family members are coming in from out of town uh, and tr or traveling across Canada or traveling back from Europe. And sometimes they won't be landing for another 12 to 24 hours. And it's important for them that, they're, that their family members are there before their loved one goes to the OR. Currently our hospital resources are being stretched to the limit. So we actually have to make sure that there's capacity in the system before we move a donor forward. All this donor testing takes time. It's quite interesting trying to get a, a cardiac angio done in the middle of the night. OR resources alone are pretty phenomenal. When our multi-organ donor goes to the OR, we need one OR room for the donor recovery and up to maybe five more rooms for the transplant surgeries. So from start to finish, it can take up to 60 hours. In the organ recovery, it is a surgical procedure like any other surgical procedure, except we have a moment of silence. The HOPE coordinators perform this, and it is time to respect our donor and to thank our donor for the gift that they are giving. The surgical recovery is completed with the utmost respect and dignity. And HOPE during this recovery uh, we also assist with the setting up of the back tables and perfu perfuse the organs at the appropriate time. The recovery usually takes four to six hours. We perfuse the organs after cross clamp to flush out the blood and start cooling them. When the organs are explanted, they, explanted, they usually come out in a set order, usually the heart first, then the lungs and liver, followed by the rest of the abdominal organs. We package the organs per Health Canada regulations, and there is massive amounts of documentation that we have to complete. Then we have to make sure that that organ goes to where it belongs. So we either deliver it across the hall when the uh, recovery is done at the University Hospital, 
could be across the river. So we're sending it in an ambulance back from the Royal Alec Hospital to the U of A, or it can be across Canada. Either we're flying organs into Edmonton or we're flying organs out of Edmonton. Sometimes I feel like a glorified organ travel agent. We book Air Canada flights or we charter planes from SunWest. When the recovery is done, our casework is not finished. We continue to forward pending serology results and pending culture results to the transplant programs. Transplant ID can attest that we call them on every case with follow-up. They continue to be involved to ensure that the recipient will have appropriate follow-up. So for instance, when we find out our donor had positive blood cultures, and this was not known at the time of accepting the organ and transplanting, we let transplant ID know, and they ensure that the recipient has appropriate antibiotic coverage. If recipients are doing poorly, either immediately following the transplant or even up to four or five years later, Hope frequently is contacted by the transplant side to review donor information and to see if uh, there was anything missed. The other thing that many times we're asked is, okay, my heart recipient is doing well. How are all the rest of the transplanted uh, recipients doing? Are they having a similar um, course of events? One of the things that I truly enjoy in my job is the family follow-up. We support our donor families and we provide them grief resources over the following year. We facilitate letter writing between the donor families and the recipients. The information at the beginning is confidential. Recipients are highly encouraged to write to the donor family and a simple thank you goes a long way from the recipient to that donor family. We have a yearly donor recognition and thank you ceremony for our donors. Unfortunately, over the past two years with COVID, we have been unable to hold this. We've started and in, initiated a donor Facebook group where the donors provide support to one another. And we have facilitated donor family and recipient meetings. I've been involved in three of these and it is the most amazing thing to be present when the recipient meets the donor family. So this is from uh, one of our last not Dow weeks. Um, we had a wall to honor our donors. We also had donor family gratitude visits. We brought our donor families back to the ICUs and they said, thank you. And the ICU staff saw these uh, individuals in a much different setting. And um, it was a positive experience for the donor family as well as the ICU staff. We've started donor memory cards where the donor family can say that they would like a card for their loved one. On the back of it has a little story about their loved one as the donor family wants. And they can give these out at the funeral or they can give them out um, uh, at different events that the family hold. And it's a wonderful thing to remember their loved one, but it's also a way to um, increase awareness. Over the past couple of years, we've had some billboard displays. And the billboards just have the donor family on them and a little message about organ and tissue donation. So our referral and donation and transplant rates. I've just got it here from the past couple of years. So in 2019, we actually had 60 local referrals, but only 38 of those cases were accepted. As I mentioned earlier, most of the organs we transplant in Edmonton come from distant programs. We had 797 calls from distant centers offering us organs. We accepted 158 of those cases. In the end, we brought in or from our local donors, we transplanted 292 organs in 2019. In 2020, the numbers are a little bit less, and I believe this is due to COVID. Just a little bit more breakdown of the actual amount of organs we transplanted. Besides our deceased program, we do have a living lung, liver, and kidney program and an autoilot program. 
the grand total includes those amounts of transplants. So the Edmonton weight list statistics, these are pretty current. Right now in Edmonton on our wait list, there's 250 plus individual waiting at any given time. Sadly, last year in 2020, 54 people passed away while they were waiting for their transplant. So why? So there's superstitious beliefs out there. There's a lack of trust in the medical system and it's very evident now with COVID. Frequently here, I will be made a donor rather than them trying to save my life when I come to hospital. Or if I talk about my death, I will bring it on. There's myths, it's against people's religion. There's very few religions that outright say that they have a dogma against transplant, uh, against donation. People will frequently say, I can't have an open casket funeral. That too is a myth. The funeral homes work diligently with the loved one to ensure that an open casket funeral can be had if that is what the family members want. There's a myth that the body will be cut up and disfigured. You're just taking too much. You're just cutting and hacking the person up. Yes, we do recover organs. Yes, we do recover tissues. But like I said earlier, the body is treated with utmost respect and dignity. When tissues are removed, eye tissue, a prosthetic is put in so the eyes don't look sunken. When the bones from the legs are removed, a, a wooden dowel is placed back so the leg still has um, shape and form. There's a fear that the medical examiner will be involved in every donation case. The medical examiner is called with every donation case. Very few times is the medical examiner actually quote unquote involved and they would have been involved anyway. So some social norms. Discussions about death at our coffee table, at our supper table, wherever, are uncommon. Our families don't know what we intend upon our death. There was a recent study, and I'm sorry I don't have um, the citation here, but it was done in Canada on feelings of don donation, and it showed that about 80% of Canadians supported organ and tissue donation, but only 25% actually had taken action regarding their feelings. Just a signature is all it takes. So is television a help or a hindrance? It's a hindrance. Even though it raises organ donation and it discusses them, many of these pop culture, culture uh, shows that I have here do talk and have episodes on organ donation, but the majority of what they say is incorrect. So that was, that is amusing, that is funny, but when you really look at it, did it send the right message? So I'm coming to a close here, my final thoughts for you. The majority of us are uh, listening to this are healthcare professionals, but we have a personal life too. So consider being a donor, sign up, Talk about donation, make sure your family and friends are aware, and in your professional life, support organ donation if you support organ donation when you're presented with it. And thank you very much. It was wonderful presenting. Thanks so much, Maxine. That was really very helpful. I think uh, uh, many times, um, you know, we kind of forget that some of the basics aren't aren't really um, 
uh, obvious to everyone. And I know that we have quite a lot of community members um, in the audience today. I, I uh, hope that some of the acronyms um, that, that I posted in the chat um, helped clear some of those up, but thank you very much. Um, let's look at some questions. Um, we have Jesse Woodward from AHS asks, how has becoming a HOPE coordinator impacted your practice as a care provider? And what advice do you have for an aspiring um, nurse RN interested in the HOPE program? Would you like to address that? Um, you know, uh, the jobs that I took before I came to the HOPE program, I, I, I love them. I would give them three years and then I would try something new. I've stayed at the HOPE program for 17 years. It's, uh, I've never wanted to leave. Um, for an aspiring nurse, um, the best advice I can give you is to go work in ICU and to get a, a really strong foundation in ICU. And then, uh, then when you're ready, you can come and apply to the HOPE program. Okay, thank you. And uh, Murray Wilson says, um, who actually alerts HOPE that there may be a donor and when do they alert HOPE? Would you like to address that? Yeah. So um, it's, it's, we usually get called from uh, the intensivist in the ICU um, or a resident, a fellow, sometimes the nurse practitioner and, and sometimes the, the bedside nurses. Um, uh, it's really important though that when we get called by the bedside nurse or a fellow that everyone um, on that unit who will be involved in managing the donor with us um, is supporting it. We, it's very difficult to move a donor forward if the intensivist is not on board. So um, we can get called by a variety of people, but uh, it's very, very important that the intensivist is on board. And um, we're called at a variety of stages. Some, sometimes we get called um, that uh, they're asking for advice and how to transfer individuals into Edmonton and we provide that advice. Sometimes families just want information um, so that then they can uh, go home, discuss it with their family, mull it over. And um, many times uh, donors are, are potential donor families um, are asking for their loved one to be a donor and it's not time for them to be a donor yet. And then sometimes we're just called after the brain death declaration. So it's, it's varied, but like I said, the sooner, like there's research out there that the sooner um, a hope, like hope coordinator or organ donation organization can be involved as part of the team um, and be seen as part of the team with that family, um, donation consent rates go up. Yes, and I, I uh, as you probably know, um, the the uh, a program has just been launched in the last few months called the Send Program, yes. which is specialist in end of uh, end of life neuroprognostication and donation. Do you have any thoughts on on how that may impact the donation process? Well, all of the uh, physicians uh, who are um, identified as Send physicians, um, they're acting as champions for organ donation as well. So. Um, it, I'm very hopeful that it will have a positive impact um, on our donation referrals and our donation rates. Terrific, yeah. Um, another, uh, some lots of comments coming in, Maxine, most saying thank you very much and what a great job. Um, Sean Delaney asks, um, in addition to saying this was a fantastic presentation, for those who don't know, oh, he's telling the rest of the audience, Maxine has been a fantastic national leader in the development of the Canadian Blood Services Transplant Registry. Um, and so on. So yes, well done. Congratulations uh, on that. And thank you, Sean, for pointing that out. Um, there's uh, another question from Sarah Chow. Uh, is there a required period of time between the two determinations of brain death? And a uh, great presentation, she adds. Do you uh, for, for adults, um, they can be done simultaneously. Um, as long as the uh, two uh, individuals who are performing it are both there to uh, witness the apnea test. For pediatric population, it's a bit different and it depends on the age of the child. So usually when the child is like a, a newborn, 
child. Um, they will want the period of time to be 24 hours between the two declarations. Uh, the older the child becomes and closer to adult, the shorter the time frame is. So, um, and it truly depends on uh, the pediatric intensivist, the time frame that they are comfortable with and uh, moving forward. A lot of times as well in the pediatric population, besides the clinical declaration by the two uh, peds intensivists, they also will do ancillary testing um, uh, as um, extra testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are more congratulations. I'm sure you can see them in there. Um, another question, uh, do we have stats on the number of tissue donations and corneal transplants in Alberta? Do you have uh, right now, no, I don't. But um, what I would suggest is ATI invite the Comprehensive Tissue Center to do a similar presentation. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. But yes, there, there are those stats. And I, um, at the top of my hand, I don't have them. Uh, yes, we did have the Comprehensive Tissue um, Center do, but it's been several years. And so you're quite right. I agree that it would be nice to have them back to do a, to do a similar talk for us. Um, uh, Nuruddin Burka is asking, what is your experience with the Canadian Blood Services Kidney HSP, that stands for Highly Sensitized Patient National Program, and how is it different than local donation? So um, every donor across Canada, when they're identified, uh, the agreement is, is that one of those donor kidneys gets offered to this uh, highly sensitized um, list. And what it has done is it, it has expanded the donor pool for these highly sensitized uh, kidney recipients. And it has done amazingly well in getting people who are greater than 95% sensitized, transplanted. Um, and it's absolutely one wonderful thing. Um, there's a little bit of sharing that has to go on, uh, but uh, it has allowed Edmonton to transplant a lot of our highly sensitized uh, kidney recipients and get them off of um, dialysis and move on with their life. That's right. It's been, uh, I'd agree, it's been a really helpful um, program that was introduced a number of years ago. Um, let's see, uh, are there any, uh, so Deb Trotman, uh, that, very informative, thank you. Are there any opportunities to volunteer with HOPE as a recipient, um, uh, such as speaking and so on? Uh, yes, there are, um, but unfortunately, we used to uh, go out and do an, a lot of public presentations. Uh, we also did um, presentations to uh, healthcare as well um, to where, raise awareness. And many times we would be bringing uh, recipients with us. And an, another audience of ours was um, nursing students. And, um, but unfortunately with COVID, many of these have like vanished. My understanding I heard from our education um, coordinator today that she's starting to book these in January. So what I would advise is um, you can send your information uh, to our program. And then um, if we need a recipient uh, to help speak with us, because stories are what in people remember, um, not so much dry statistics and things like that, but recipient stories, donor stories, that's what people remember the most. And um, so yes, there are opportunities. Great, that sounds very interesting. Um, can you uh, help us, um, can you explain how mandatory consideration is implemented in Alberta? Um, so when, uh, when a donor is um, potentially identified in an ICU setting, it, it is up to the MRP to um, have man, like a consideration of whether or not the individual uh, should be referred on to donation. Um, they, can, uh, re they can call and refer, uh, they can consult with their colleagues, um, but it's just a consideration for referral. Um, they don't call on every case, but they definitely consider. And now with Connect Care, um, uh, they have the ability to enter a note and we have, um, as part of the send uh, 
physician project that has been just that grant that occurred in Alberta. Um, there is also part of it for a uh, death audit. So if physicians are entering a note in Connect Care that they did consider organ donation and they felt it was uh, not suitable, um, that would be absolutely wonderful and allow the SEND program to um, gather the data they need uh, to move forward and hopefully increase uh, referral rates. Yeah, I, I think they, you're, you're right. The uh, SEND program is going to have, we hope, uh, look forward to a real impact on how things are organized here. Um, from Andrew Masood, were there significant changes in the practice guidelines for organ donation and transplantation during the years of the pandemic? And um, a follow-up question from him, any learnt lessons from this unprecedented time in terms of the organ donation legislation and practice perspective? Well, the really big thing that uh, changed practice for us was um, ensuring that all our donors are COVID tested, um, the timing of the COVID tests and the location of the COVID tests. So um, if lungs are being considered, we also need a, a deep uh, a specimen from a spew, like ET tube or a BAL, um, and ensuring that was there. Um, not so much about donor management, but um, for us flying. So part, part of the presentation that I, I didn't put in there because probably too much, but uh, the HOPE program, when we get referrals from distant centers, um, in the past, we used to fly a lot to the distant centers and do the recoveries. Um, when that center was unable to do the recovery. And one thing we've done is um, we've really worked with the distance centers to have them perform the recoveries for us. And so we're just arranging airplanes and the organs are getting on the airplanes and we pick them up from the airport. Um, that has hugely changed our practice. Uh, Unfortunately, as many of you all know, Saskatchewan has closed their donation program right now because of COVID. They just don't have the staff. So that's truly unfortunate. We've been able to carry on. Many, uh, up to three of our coordinators right now have, are in ICU working. Um, so we have less staff. I'm actually retired. <laughs> so I'm back working my pretty much my normal, um, what I was, prior to my retiring to help the program out so that um, there are enough uh, bodies here to do the job. Um, and I'm hopeful that the COVID rates become manageable and things can go back to normal. Um, yes, uh, yes, of course we all do. And it's a terrible thing that we've seen uh, the rates in Saskatchewan to such a, play, uh, such a point where the, the donation donor programs have been shut down um, for the moment. Um, a couple more questions. Um, in the UK, laws have been passed that everyone is considered an organ or tissue donor unless they opt out. Oh yes, this is the pre presumed consent legislation uh, that is in place in a number of countries. Maxine, do you think this is the way to go for Canada to increase donor numbers and awareness? This of course is a, a hot topic. And this is from Femina Chaudhry. It is a hot topic. Um, it's not as simple as just changing the legislation, the um, presentations that have been given in the past. Uh, the big things that have been identified are um, don't, uh, our awareness, public awareness, public education, uh, changing the culture around donation. Um, Alberta has a culture that's different than the rest of the cultures across Canada, I feel and um, mandating something in Alberta that the government would mandate, even though it's such a beneficial thing, um, would have to be done very delicately. So we really have to read the culture of our, our area before we would take that step. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be a good step, but um, it has to be handled very sensitively if we're going to move forward like that. Um, and just for people's awareness, um, uh, Nova Scotia recently enacted legislation um, that, uh, uh, to this effect, um, it's the first jurisdiction in North America to have done so. So there are a number of um, processes underway right now to watch 
how that happens and how it rolls out and what the impact is not only on um, not only on uh, obviously on donation numbers but on public awareness of this process and how it may impact um, widely uh, at the moment we're getting very positive reports that uh, that the public engagement in the opt-out process in Nova Scotia has been very well received so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, the, the process of evaluating that has been um, um, as it moves forward over the next little while. Uh, for sure, opt-out is, is as, as we heard, is, is a hot topic, but it also contributes to our understanding that, um, that, that, that if you look at the highest performing systems, such as uh, Spain, for example, and Croatia and other places, uh, that it's one piece of a multi um, a, 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 a process that has many, many pieces built into the systems and that the highest performing jurisdictions um, understand that it's not one single thing such as the legislation, but it's many things that contribute to a well-run and well-organized and efficient system. Um, I would just mention as well that there are uh, that there is legislation um, currently being considered in the process uh, in the province of Alberta, and we'll be um, uh, uh, we'll be looking at that and um, assisting with expert um, um, ex uh, expertise to the individuals responsible for that. Um, as you can see in the um, chat, uh, there's a um, a, a website there for um, public perceptions about opt-out legislation, and uh, you can also access one of our recent seminars looking at that. Um, the the uh, uh, legislation that I spoke of is being uh, organ is being um, worked on by MLA R.J. Sigurdsson, who's the MLA from Highwood, as a private member's bill. And so, this um, stay tuned to 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 uh, hear more about this in the coming months um, because it will probably go forward in the springtime. Um, I think we're just about. Uh, well, no, um, we also have a comment from and a question from Jesse Woodward. Uh, thank you again for. Oh yes, she's she, she, he or she, Jesse, contributed um, the comment at the beginning. Thank you again for the insightful presentation. Doing what you do on a daily basis must be incredibly challenging. Is this why all hope coordinator positions are part time? How do you and your colleagues maintain your own emotional and mental health? Would you like to close on that one, Maxine? Well, I believe we're all part time just simply because we're on call so much. <laughs> so we, we do need time off. It is extremely important for us to have a good work-life balance. Um, otherwise, yeah, there are times when um, uh, the job can be all-consuming. There also are donor cases that stay with each one of us. Um, some are good, some are bad. I still can remember my first uh, organ donor case. Um, I remember a lot of cases that bring, that um, are very emotionally challenging. Um, it's important, like I said, good work-life balance. Um, yoga is a good thing for me. Um, each, uh, each one of my colleagues has different downtime activities um, that uh, they, they do to maintain that um, a good emotional health. And like all individuals right now, we, we can access lots of resources. Um, many times when we've had challenging cases, we have debriefs, debriefing sessions together uh, to make sure that um, we're emotionally and, and uh, mentally healthy from that. Well, thank you. We do, of course, those of us that have worked with you um, absolutely support uh, that, that as closing. You, you've been a real champion over the years, and um, we very much appreciate you giving this seminar today. Uh, I'll also thank um, Paladin for supporting the seminar series and let everyone know that next week's seminar is um, Sonia Cressman from the Simon Fraser University, who's going to talk about modeling the economics of kidney transplantation in the post-genomic era. So please see the chat box for the link for that. And uh, once again, we thank you. Thank you to Maxine and thank you for such an engaged audience. Thank you.